All right, wow, that was quite the introduction. Um, so Jim has been asking me any, any special requests for his intro, so I was like, no, no, just introduce me however you want, it's fine, like, you can use chat, GPT, whatever. So yeah, he sent me the prompt that had like a really good, well-written uh, synopsis, and I asked him to ask chat GPT to make it into rap lyrics, because if you haven't done that, like it's worth paying for GPT-4 just to have it do it. Like, like, yes, it can write code. Yes, it can, like, write pretty decent, like, doctor's notes. But, like, the thing that's, like, shook me the most is, like, asking it to just, like, write rap lyrics about the thing that it, like, eloquently output, it will turn it into rap lyrics. And it's, like, like there's something going on there. Like, it's not conscious yet, but it, it's too creative. Like, the Phoenix Flames in one of the, one of the bars. Uh, anyway, thank you, Jim. That was <laughs> unnecessary. But fantastic. <laughs> All right, uh, talk about the road to Live U 1.0, but like I feel very confident now, like I'm, I am hyped. Um, all right, yeah, so it's been a long road. Uh, but before I get started, I gotta plug Fly.io. Any Fly.io users here? All right, excellent, thank you, keeping me employed. Uh, Fly's fantastic for deploying your Elixir and Phoenix applications. Uh, it's basically like the Heroku experience, but you can get a private IPv6 network, so it's like, everything you wanted from Heroku before they just stopped working on things. Uh, so you can deploy an app all over the world, <laughs> cluster together, and uh, like I have an app deployed that's on every continent except Antarctica, and your Erlang cluster just connects globally, and it's amazing. So check us out, give them a big thank you, because that's what let, lets me work on Phoenix uh, almost full time. But if we look at Live View, what it, take, what it took to get us close to 1.0, it's been five, almost five years, which is kind of scary because I wouldn't have thought it would take so long. Uh, also, time goes very fast. So going through the last 3,000 commits, like I pulled out some big milestones, and there's not that many here, so it's kind of humbling. You're like, what have we been doing for five years? But like, not in any of this list is like all of the JavaScript that I had to write for everybody, all right? So <laughs> there's, a lot, there's a lot going on here. But, we're gonna talk about a lot of this today, but it's been uh, several big milestones that I feel like were needed to get us from this initial promising prototype to something that I'm ready to stamp as like, this is the way we should build apps and you can rely on the, the interfaces. Uh, but I wanna go back to like why I started LiveView in the first place. So this is actually, I, I pulled a few slides from a talk I gave in 2018, one of the first um, presentations of, about LiveView. And it's like the, the motivations were like, for me, coming from the stateless web, uh, I came up in PHP, so I shipped my first production app in 2003, so I've been doing this for 20 years now, which is kind of, kind of bizarre. Uh, but, you know, I grew up on the stateless web. It was very simple. We just had a server, got a request in, it puked out some HTML, and the interface was just there, uh, but it was stateless, so you couldn't do much with it. So to accomplish any kind of side effect, you'd have to, like, throw some text over to the server, it would puke out some text back, the page would update, and it would work. But it was a very like static experience, very low uh, in the UX department, but it was great for like documents. So super low complexity, but we wanted to start building safe, stateful applications, you know, but those, like, like a desktop-like app, but that required a lot more rich UX and higher complexity. So due to a series of unfortunate events, uh, the only way we could do that by using state on the client was a library or language called JavaScript. Uh, came around and that's what ships on all browsers uh, because reasons. Uh, so we had this model of like, okay, let's do some stateful web applications. So we had some state on the client and the JavaScript munged some strings and puked out some HTML and that worked well. But then we had to like have all this glue code go into the server like using uh, JSON APIs, ad hoc, uh, Ajax requests, GraphQL, ad hoc WebSocket requests, whatever you want, needed to do. And that gave us this rich UX, uh, but it came at high complexity. And for, you know, from the 2008 time frame to pretty much 10 years, 2018, when, when LiveView really got started, was this, we were in this realm of like, yeah, we can do these appy like things, but it, it came at a, a huge cost. And the cost just kept growing and growing. Because what I was trying to do was like, okay, I'm building Phoenix applications, and I just wanna show some rich UI. And this wasn't like trying to build Slack or something special, it's like, I just wanna show an error on a web page. And like, if you know how the web works, like it, it's, it makes sense why it's hard to do this uh, in real time, but like intuitively, it's always like, it's like we have some HTML on the server, we can show, hey, the phone number can't be blank. Like why does it cost the world to just show an error on a web page? Like this shouldn't be difficult. So this is like my mindset coming in like top down. Like why, why is it difficult, right? What if we could just make it easy? 
because like the issue is like the user gets this kludgy experience where they have to like try to sign up for your app and it tells them, oh, it can't be blank. Then they try to enter some bogus information. Oh, it has to be a number. They click submit. Oh, some data's already been taken. Like there's this obvious need for a, a rich experience. It's just the cost has always been extremely high to, to get there because we have to like then do all this work on the client, move a bunch of logic to the client, and logic necessarily has to exist on the server even if we're doing a full single page app. We have to get like some localization data down to the server, so then you start thinking like, how do I bundle my localization file? I have to open an endpoint for that. I want to split it up because I don't want to send a large payload down. I have to open up AJAX requests. I have to write routes. I have to write controllers. Like it becomes this crazy like labyrinth just to like show an error on a web page, and like this was ridiculous to me. So this is kind of the motivation for LiveView. Like, what if we could just make this as simple and intuitive as just writing a, a state, stateless application? And I've showed this before, but you know, it's like, why is like the input on one side, you're like, you're, well, literally the input in this labyrinth, but like you want to make a rich UI on an input element, and you have to go through this like ever involved labyrinth of like framework adoption uh, that keeps changing. You have to bring some stateful thing on the client, like Redux. You have to figure out how to talk to the server, so maybe you're using GraphQL. Serverless is a thing now, apparently. And then on the outside of that, other side is like showing the phone number can't be blank on an input. Like, why was that? Why is this required? Like what if we could just throw all this away? And what I said in 2018 was, was important. It was like I was trying to make a point in 2018 like LiveView is not, not going to be great for a ton of single page apps, but it can be great for a large class of the things we're using single page apps for. And I listed in 2018, and I forgot about this till I was putting my talk together, a few, a few examples. Like you know, most of our applications you know, aren't something like Google Docs or Google Maps or Spotify.com. And uh, coming back to this, almost five years later, it's like, oops, I actually went off and made Spotify.com. Uh, and I forgot that I listed it as like something in my head in 2018 was like, oh, surely we would never use LiveView for that. And then like one of the first like big things I built uh, in open source was like something like Spotify.com. Uh, so there's a LiveView uh, open source application. It's kind of like a showcase for what you can do with LiveView. So like unbeknownst to my past self, I went off and like made one of the things that in my head I couldn't make. Uh, so it's neat coming on the other side. It's like, well, could you make a web player in this web experience with LiveView, and it's like, yes, you can. I did it. It's like an amazing experience for the developer. It's amazing for the user. It's like collaborative. You can see what other users are listening to. Like Phoenix Presence is there. You can do all these things. So we can start saying like, well, as the requirements of our apps since the last five years have like shifted to the right, you know, LiveView has, has kept up. And even like Google Docs. If you think like Google Docs, like surely you would use a single page app framework, and that would be a reasonable choice even today, but you think like Livebook. Livebook is a collaborative code editor, right? It's a collaborative ed editor, and it probably does more things than Google Docs, right? You can, you have smart cells, you have all this interactive UI, and like it's built on top of LiveView. So it's like as we've chipped away, it's like neat how like even as like the requirements of like what we all want to build has grown, like the LiveView model, the thing that I wanted to tackle of like, oh, show an error on a web page has like mapped really well to like, oh, just build like a Spotify, uh, web player, uh, do a collaborative code notebook. Like Livebook is free and open source, and there are like companies in the Python community that has raised, have raised millions of dollars to make collaborative code notebooks for Python, and like a team of at Dashbit was able to write Livebook in like a shocking, uh, shockingly small amount of time. So they did an amazing amount of work, uh, Jonathan especially, uh, incredible. Um, so I'm not saying, it's, I don't want to take credit because it's all because of LiveView, but it, to me, the fact that the team was able to focus on all of the things that were required to make collaborative code fragments and the code server execution model work in Elixir, they were able to, to basically punt on much of the JavaScript complexity. Obviously, there's some JavaScript in Livebook, but I like to think that like, it allowed the team to actually focus on what mattered, which is building collaborative code notebooks, not building a collaborative UI in React or Vue.js, and then also trying to figure out the Elixir side. So um, pretty neat that we've been able to chip away a lot, a lot of the use cases that I previously thought were impossible. And like the idea isn't new, so I think, you know, this is, uh, I think I had a conversation with Joe Armstrong in, in 2015 in Krakow at the first or second Elixir Comp EU, and he, in his book, had this kind of idea of similar to what LiveView is doing. He, he has an example of like opening up a WebSocket, sending some content back to the client, and having the client update the DOM, and that being like, hey, no framework required, a few lines of code, you can do this, this rich thing. So it's, not that LiveView kind of birthed this idea, but I do like to think that we kind of spearheaded this movement and we've seen pretty much every main ecosystem copy or try to copy what LiveView is doing uh, today, which is so it's pretty cool to see that. 
Um, but I like to say, like, if I use 001 in 2018, uh, I like to, I refer to it as like a beautiful dumpster fire. Like, like this, this little graphic's perfect. Like, look how happy he is to be on fire. Um, <laughs> It was essentially like these 12 lines of JavaScript. Like this, it, there was obviously more than this, but this would, if you wanted to build your own baby live view where I started, this is the prototype, and it would pro this would actually work. Um, I, I used Phoenix channels to open up a WebSocket connection to the server, and we just said, hey, what if I could just render the template and just send that HTML over the wire? So when you join, if you've got some HTML, replace the whole document, enter HTML. When you get an out-of-man update on line three, or line four, you do the same thing, and then you just listen to some window events like click or form submit, and you push an event up the channel, it re-renders the template. It pukes out some HTML, you replace the inner HTML. So this was LiveView 001, and it was like amazing. It was terrible, but it was amazing. So like the programming model, what I wanted to do was like react on the server, right? So like it was amazing in that like in a horrible hack of code, I got the programming model. Like I always start top down, and then uh, and then Jose has to figure out how to make it not terrible, but. Um, I started top down, right? Like, what if we could just take React's programming model, put it on the server, and React has this, this lovely insight where, where what if we could co-locate the highly coupled things in our application, which is the, the template and then the state and the functions that operate on that template. So I just said, like, hey, let's just do that on the server. So like, this was the first live view with that hack of JavaScript replacing uh, the HTML on, on every change, rendering the whole template on every change. Uh, so it, it was beautiful because like the programming model to me was exactly what I wanted. Like I knew there was something special there because like everything just worked and it felt magical. The page just updated. I no longer had to write routes or controllers. I didn't have to think about HTTP at all. Um, but it was awful. So it's like no matter how good the developer experience was, if we couldn't make it viable, then like no matter how productive you, you were, if it was too expensive to run on the server, too expensive on the network, then it wasn't going to be viable. So really this prototype that I think I demoed in 2018 um, it didn't, like, it was an impressive demo, but it was not viable. So what made it viable was uh, uh, Jose writing the live EEX engine. So this was really the big first step into figuring out how to make this a viable programming model. Uh, so I'll review briefly what Leaks does, because it's been replaced, it's since been replaced, which I'll talk about, but we still use the underpinnings of what the optimization, uh, the, op the optimizations that Leaks brought. So what Leaks did is like, takes your naive template, and then at compile time, we say like, well, a lot of that is just regular strings, right? It's not anything that's not dynamic Elixir code, we know isn't gonna change. So at compile time, we're able to split the template apart, and then we essentially compile down to if statements, it actually is a case statement, but, which, but a case statement, or an if is just a macro which goes to a case, so anyway, this code is still valid, conceptually and, and literally. Um, so we, we essentially compile down to a bunch of if checks. So like instead of having to reevaluate your template every time on the server, if you just want to change an individual, individual value, we turn this into a data structure that has a bunch of lazy invocations that say like, since live view is stateful now, we know the values before and the values that may have changed. So we, we do a no op if the value didn't change. So we don't expend resources doing a string uh, format time if the time didn't change. And then we have this data structure that falls out that has all the static bits the dynamic values that may or may not have been evoked, and then we frame print that with a, an, an ID that the client understands. But what this allows us to do is like a, an incredible optimization that like still blows my mind. So like the client is able to get this like data structure that we convert to JSON when the live view mounts, and it has these dynamic values and static values split. It keeps that as a cache. So when the server does some like assign to a new value, it just produces this tiny uh, data on the wire that's just like at dynamic index two, put this new value in place. Or at dynamic index zero and three, the mode has changed. And the client just gets this payload and it says, ah, the template hasn't changed, so the only way, the only thing I need to do to realize the new template is merge that value. So we take, we say at dynamic index two, it's just an object merge, literally it just becomes 70. And then we have a new string of markup, and to make it efficient on the client, we pass that off to morph DOM, which is a library to officially patch the DOM. So it's like this really dumb, naive programming model somehow became this magical, magically efficient thing on the server, because we're doing uh, limited resources on the server to render. It became efficient on the network, because we're sending minimal diffs. It became efficient on the client, because we're doing minimal patches. Uh, somehow, like it still, still blows my mind. Like I didn't, I didn't think we would get there as quickly as we did. I thought like maybe something would have to drastically change with the programming model, but it's like, no, this top-down beautiful dumpster fire became really compelling. Uh, so this is a, a example I wrote in 2018. Let me have to click, click play here. It's like an autocomplete list. 
And like, this is still magical to me. So it's like at every create press, we're sending an event to the server and then it's generating autocomplete results from like the system, di system dictionary. But like the amazing thing is what fell out of leaks was payloads that you see in the console logs. So like as I'm typing, it's re-rendering it's re the entire Elixir template. And the only thing that actually falls out in the diff on the network on the wire is this like keyless payload of the strings that, that we are rendering in the template in a for comprehension. But like we didn't have to think about that. So like if you had hand rolled this with your own JSON API, writing Ajax or GraphQL, like it would be a larger payload. So it's like somehow this naive programming model doing a for comprehension produces a better payload that you could, than you could write by hand and you didn't have to think about that. You actually didn't even think about the web request. You didn't open up a route, you didn't write a controller, you didn't write a serializer, you just wrote dumb code. So there was something very special on this like transition to leaks where it's like, like holy crap, like this is actually like extremely good. Like, it, like live you started as like what if we could have this like worse is better approach um, but then it was like oh my god we can actually like just be better than single page apps in some cases. Didn't mean to quit there. So it started showing quite a bit of, of promise and then we focused on doing some other niceties. Uh, I grouped these together because they came around about the same time but live navigation is something we don't talk about enough. It's basically like uh, the PJAX approach or the Turbolinks approach if you're familiar of like what if we didn't have to reload all the JavaScript and CSS on every page navigation? The user would have to, you know, would get a faster response time, except we're doing that plus we do navigation over the existing WebSocket connection. So basically you can think like one round trip request, uh, instead of having to do like a TLS negotiation to do a, a page refresh, we're doing a single like WebSocket frame back and forth to do navigation. So the user's getting all of this, uh, all this better latency, but also something over an existing connection. So it's even faster than like the PJAX approach. And then we added live view uploads, which is like, it's one of the features that it took forever, but it's almost like it, if I didn't use live view for any other reason, uh, which I use it for everything, but if I wasn't using live view, there, it makes uploads so easy that like that would be the only reason, that'd be the reason I would reach for it. It's like, I haven't seen another ecosystem that gives you interactive file uploads um, easier than what we can provide. Uh, so I just want to show a quick demo of that. M many of you may have already seen it, but I have this uh, Spotify.com. Hey, someone's on, someone's on here. Who is this? Is this person here? <laughs> this is uh, actually the app the apps deployed on fly. So interesting. Um, usually people don't use this, uh, so I'm actually. <laughs> it's all right. So let's see let's see what they've uploaded here. Okay, no music. Who is this? Okay. Okay, probably a bunch of pirated music. Um, so every six hours, I have a, I, I delete the songs because when I launched this and wrote a blog post about it, like 99% of what was uploaded was not like royalty free. It was like all copyrighted. Anyway, so cool. It, presence works. Cool. I wasn't even gonna show that off. Okay, so this is live beats. So we can like we can play some songs. I, I'm not gonna send audio over, but you can see like I have this web player. It's playing. If uh, whoever Wales 1992 is, he would see what's happening. Like if I paused and played in the advanced tracks, uh, that, would all, that would sync to his browser. Uh, but as I navigate around now, we can see this web player is still alive. So this is why like the whole Spotify.com thing, I never thought we could do something like this, but it turns out like Elixir processes, right, can be independent. Uh, so we have a, a nested live view here for the player that's just like doing its own thing, subscribe to PubSub, waiting for events. And as I navigate around to routable live views, like that web player just stays, stays fixed. Oh my goodness. Good thing there's no chat here. <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. Um, so yeah, so live navigation, like it's not just about better user experience. I mean, the moral of the story is like instead of regular hrefs, you should be using link navigate. And instead of a redirect call, you should be doing push navigate and you're going to have better user experience. Uh, but you can also do really neat things like you have actual stateful UI, right? Like if we had real navigation events, this the web player would be blown away. So this is like, it's a necessity for certain types of, types of applications, but you should be using it in place of regular navigation in, in any case. And then we have uploads, and uploads are uh, pretty compelling. This is over like, uh, I'm doing it over my cell network, so we'll see how slow this is, but um, yeah, it's gonna be really slow. It's fine, I, I intend, well, it might, it might be way too slow. Okay, here it goes. Okay, so we can see file, file progress as I selected the file is going, and the neat thing is like, this is, reporting this file progress isn't like an Ajax call going up and then the template receiving that. This is just like dumb live view code, like doing an assign and doing like a, a template, doing, setting the upload progress to like a width of a div, right? And you can see as the upload finished, as I was talking here, suddenly the artist got populated and the website for the artist got populated. 
And that happened because we're just writing Elixir code, and since Elixir is concurrent, we didn't have to like write a background job. The live view just receives the file. Since we're uploading the file over the WebSocket connection, we can just read it directly. Uh, I parse the file, pull out the MP3 metadata, and then update it in the UI. Uh, but the cool thing is, like, if you imagine the incantations you'd have to do for any other platform, like even you know, if you think about Ruby or even Go, something that can do highly concurrent apps, like they would probably be load balanced to over HTTP uploads to like a different server. So then, even trying to lift the metadata out, like. How do you get that back to the user's UI, potentially over the network on a different server? Maybe you're using director S3 uploads, which we also support, but maybe you're using direct to S3 uploads, and then, oh, I need to parse the MP3 metadata. So, oh, actually, I can just write like a Lambda, right? And I can just pay S3 every time I want to invoke this function that can just send metadata out. Oh, but how do I get it back to the UI? It's like, well, okay, I need to put on SQS. So I'll pay them to also put on SQS, and then I'll consume it in my app. Oh, I gotta write the consumer. Okay, I, I pull it out of the consumer in my app. Oh, how do I get it back on the UI? Okay, I have to broadcast it somewhere. Um, okay, we pick up the broadcast, and then, okay, how's the client gonna get it? Do they have a WebSocket connection? No, they open a WebSocket connection, or they do HTTP polling to say, is the metadata there? And then they update the template, and, and they have it, right? So if you think like the amount of things required, regardless of like using Amazon or not, to get this metadata out into the UI is, it boggles the mind. But if you're writing a live view app, like you just, say consume uploaded entry. We know the file's right there on disk because it went to the same server, and we read the file information. Oh, we wanna update the metadata? We literally just do like assign <laughs> artist to the metadata. Like we don't even think about having to consume some background worker or some background queue. So, so it's amazing to me like the things you don't have to think about that just fall away. Um, but as I've been talking here about this, like the cool thing is like this is a live view, it's alive. So this file is just uploaded 100%. It's a temporary file waiting on disk just waiting for us to do something with it. So if I click save here, we can move it to some file and location on disk. Oh, hey, validations work, cool. I've already added this. If you click save, that's gonna persist this to the database and move it on disk somewhere. So uploads are amazing, uh, definitely check it out. Even if you wanna go down the S3 path, uh, we also support external uploaders, so that's just gonna work as well. So we did that for a while, that was probably like a year of work. I forget at this point, lots of JavaScript was involved. Um, and we also ship lifecycle hooks. And this is something I don't think we talk about enough and haven't talked about enough historically. Um, but a good way to check out how that works, and you might be already using it today, is the Phoenix 1.7 authentication generators use LiveView by default. So you're using lifecycle hooks out of the box if you run mix Phoenix gen off. Uh, but what lifecycle hooks do essentially is like the plug pipeline approach for LiveView. It's like how do I have code run on mount and uh, dispatch somewhere to some shared code path, or what if I wanna have uh, a library that handles specific events coming from the client, like a handle event clause? Like the only way to do that before lifecycle hooks was like a bunch of code injection. And uh, it's, it's, it's very uh, convenient of me to say this, but like you should avoid code injection wherever possible. Um, I get to do it because I'm special, but um, <laughs> you know, like time and time again, people would have to be, would be doing all this code injection and we needed a way to solve it and give people a way to compose different events and lifecycle hooks was, was the answer. So if you ever find yourself like doing a quote and well, if you ever find yourself writing quote and you should stop and think for a moment, there's a good book you can check out on, on what to think about, but um, you should really think in live view, anytime you're trying to inject code, it's likely it's better solved with lifecycle hooks. And I like to think like the next big transition in the, the timeline is this move from leaks to heeks. <laughs> Sorry about the naming, but yeah, Heeks is the new templating engine that that's really, was really a requirement for 1.0. And uh, is Marlis here from Surface? He may or may not be here, gave, gave a talk about Surface. So Marlis is the creator of a library called Surface. It builds on top of Phoenix LiveView. And I can thank Marlis for spearheading, uh, pretty much if Marlis hadn't gone and built Surface, we wouldn't have Heeks. And I can't imagine not having Heeks, so we'll talk about why. But uh, Marlis went off and built a layer on top of Phoenix LiveView and, and really innovated in areas of like uh, HTML, aware, HTML aware template engines and declarative assigns, and he was kind enough to contribute that back to LiveView. Uh, so this transition from leaks to heeks solved a number of problems that we saw with LiveView and essentially gave us uh, a, a smaller building block. And uh, this, I can credit Jose with this. Um, so I, you know, I, hadn't, I wasn't thinking about the benefits of a smaller building block. You, you notice a common theme. I, I start higher level and then Joe says like, but what if, there, there are all these little pieces here that we can split these things into. Um, but function components fell out of the Heeks effort. And if you think about like how you compose code in Elixir, it's like what we had prior to 
the Heeks templating engine was like modules. Like you could write a live view or you could write a live component and that's how you can encapsulate a markup and some behavior state around that markup. And Jose was like, no, there's a smaller component. Like it's a function, right? Like what's, a, what's the smallest component we have in Elixir? It's a function. So function components are functions. Um, so it's a smallest building block to just compose and encapsulate markup. But Heeks brought more than that. So it brought a nicer syntax because uh, one of the most triggering things, especially after seeing uh, what Marlos is doing in Surface, is like why, why if the goal of our templates is to like compose dynamic stuff within markup, why did the structure of the markup get lost? So this is like a standard uh, table with some dynamic rows, with some, within that dynamic row is some dynamic columns, and like you see stuff like this, right? And you're like, oh my gosh, like, ugh. Ah. So the, the, the biggest problem with this is like, even if you're like, well, this is fine, the biggest problem is the structure of the markup gets lost, and if you remove one of those TRs, or like these, if these were all just divs, you would have yeah, good luck figuring that out. But if you if you missed one with leaks, we wouldn't validate the HTML. So like you would not know. It would very be very easy to produce invalid mark, markup, and you wouldn't know about it until you ran it through some HTML validator or the web page didn't look right. So Heeks was a vast improvement syntactically over that. That's the same amount of code with the for comprehension with the if checks. Uh, now we have this like special syntax to use within tags. So it, it solved the markup, uh, writing markup and uh, the structure problem uh, beautifully, but it, it was more than that. It wasn't just a nice, nicer syntax. Because to understand function components, you really have to understand slots. And I, I, I like to think slots have been around forever because it's been like over a year since we shipped them, but Phoenix apps, like the Phoenix generators didn't start using slots until 1.7, uh, just uh, earlier this year. So they're very new. I think a lot of people haven't internalized what slots are, and I had the same thing. Like I was, we talked to, to Marlis, and I would be like, I don't really get slots. Like, it, you know, why is this necessary? Um, and this is an idea that I think came out of Vue.js, but it, it also is uh, part of like web components now as well. But I'm, I hope hope I can try to help you internalize why slots are like this absolute requirement for building composable UI pieces. If you think about before we had heeks or slots. If you wanted to write some like reusable table, you would have like a table template somewhere and you might refer to this as like a partial or partial template. So you'd say, great, this encapsulates all, all the CSS styling and classes and I can give it some rows and then I can dynamically assign the fields. Like, hey, for all these rows, which could be like users, I wanna render the ID and the username. And you're like, this is awesome. It's composable and reusable. But then you're like, oh, I wanna render some blog posts. And then you're like, oh, but I want the title to be like specially formatted and bold but you, there's no composition piece in there. So you're like, oh, I'll just do a post table function. Um, and, but then how, you're like, oh, but I have all this markup from the original table that I can't reuse, so I'll just copy paste it. You know, it's the best I can do. But then it gets even worse than that, because imagine you say like, well, I actually wanna put my own dynamic content within the first, the first field. I don't want the title to be just bold. I wanna say whatever from a caller's perspective, I wanna write my own markup, my own template content. And like the only thing you could do, you wouldn't want to do this, but like there was no primitive to do that. So like the only way to do that would be like your fields thing could accept closures that like yielded back the each row item and then you could produce like a string of markup and then you, or like try to worry about HTML escaping. Like you wouldn't do this, but this is like, this is all you could do. So like there was a missing primitive here of like how does a caller provide actual dynamic content to another component? So. This top example here of this template partial can be recreated with heeks and slots as this. Uh, so you might be thinking like, oh, this is nicer, but you know, it's just, just syntax sugar, but it's more than that, right? So the, the caller in this case can reuse this table function component, which is just a function, which we'll see in a moment. So any caller can say, okay, I wanna, I wanna use table, I want it to look like all the tables in the rest of the app, and then they can define this colon call syntax to say the table has a column slot and for each column I can define any number of them because a table could have arbitrary number of columns and within that column we can pass the user or basically each of the items that they pass in as a row. We can define a label and then we can produce content. So this is the equivalent like just render a user ID or user username but the whole point of slots is no, the caller can pass whatever they want within there. So now I can just say, no, okay, the column for ID is gonna be a link. I can call other, other function components there or I can just embed a uh, raw markup like a font icon. So slots are a required piece of uh, primitive to build composable UIs. Like there's no way to do this otherwise unless you start hoisting anonymous functions around with like strings of, of templates everywhere. 
So this is something that like as you are building applications and you want the caller to have more control versus writing like bespoke functions everywhere, slots come in and give the caller that control. And you'll see examples of that in the core components file of Phoenix 1.7 applications. We have a table, we have a modal, uh, we've got a bunch of components in the function components in there that define slots and hopefully uh, teach people exactly how to build these kind of things. And function components also have what we call declarative assigns. And again, I can, th I can credit Marlos with this for uh, spearheading this in Surface and then contributing it back to Live View. So one of the problems people have had historically is as they build out these templates and they have these reusable pieces, it's like you, it's like you have to code golf around to figure out like what does this component accept? Like, is it does it take a rows attribute or does it take a uh, items attribute? Well, now you just declaratively say the attributes that are accepted or the slot that's accepted above the function. And then your function component is just a function and you define a sigil h and then within there you can um, call a slot just by um, iterating over, over the columns here. And the nice thing is at compile time now, the compiler is gonna tell you if you pass, let's say, items instead of rows, you get a compiler warning exactly as you would want so it takes the guesswork out. It also provi it provides uh, documentation for you out of the box. So Hex was like this, like we had this amazing programming model that was productive, but Hex is basically the requirement to make it not suck at scale, especially across the team. So I can't imagine having not landed here and I have to give Marlis a huge credit for that. But another big gaping uh, missing piece was uh, what we're calling streams, but what I referred to historically as just optimized collections. Uh, it's a way for you to not hold things in memory on the server, but update a collection on the client. Like people have needed this since day one and we had this like hacky solution originally. Anyone that's ever used PHX update append or prepend would be aware of this. Like it worked, but it didn't work well. So if you wanted to have, let's say, a list of to-dos, uh, the whole goal is like show the to-dos on the page, but keeping those in memory is expensive, right? If you have 100 to-dos, there's no reason to hold on to them. We just want to render them and throw them away. So you could uh, say that they're a temporary assign, so they stay out of memory, and then to update a container with a new to-do, you would like assign back to the to-dos, but you would just say, hey, there's just one item here. And then we would do some hackery on the client to say, even though this container was re-rendered with one to-do, like make it look like the server had sent us everything. Um, so it was this like back and forth dance on the client to make this work and it worked but it was hacking on the client, it was expensive and it was very rigid. Like you couldn't easily say I want to prepend in some cases and uh, append in others like a timeline and you couldn't easily delete some things on the client because the server wasn't aware of, of what they were. It's like fire and forget. Uh, so the idea with streams came in where we just had a very similar interface like the PHX update append prepend was very easy. It just like had, it, it just didn't work very well for what people wanted to build. But we had a very similar interface with streams where we could say instead of the for comprehension going over an assign, you now do a for comprehension over this streams assign that has the to do's uh, nested underneath it. And then we have a DOM ID, a DOM ID that we've pre computed for you, but the very little of the code changed as far as like that comprehension is concerned. And instead of PHX update append or prepend, it's now PHX update stream. And then instead of assign socket to do's, it's stream socket to do's. And for inserting new items or updating an existing item, and we have a stream insert API. So like the amount of code here is the exact same, but the interface is, is way more capable. So we can do prepins, we can do upins, and we can do these dynamically. So within the same container, I can say append these items, prepin these items. Uh, we can delete things from the server now. That required like JavaScript to do before. And uh, if, if that, if that, JavaScript deleted something that itself rendered a live component that would, that would actually break, like it would be a bug, the server wouldn't clean up after itself. So we've solved all that with streams. The server can now delete things uh, on the client and everything gets cleaned up. You can prepend and upend. Uh, so like we use the list uh, enum at, like uh, at zero is gonna be uh, prepend and then negative one is like access in the end of a collection. So to append it's gonna be uh, insert at negative, negative one. But it's even more powerful than that. Uh, we are adding limits. So limits is on the main branch. It'll be out with Live View 019. Uh, limit is a way for you to say, like, I, as I'm adding these new items to the client, it's fire and forget. Like, as I'm, let's say, like infinite scrolling, I don't want to load a thousand items into the document. And this is a thing that I think historically has prevented people from saying, like, oh, Live View would be great for like building a Slack clone or something with like a lot of collections, uh, a lot of items in the in the DOM because. The more and more items you pack in the DOM, the slower and slower the browser gets. So with stream limit, you can now just say like as I'm appending or prepending items, like the top example, I'm inserting these new to-dos at zero, so I'm prepending them, and I just want to keep the first 10. So limit's just going to say 
Anytime we add items, make sure they're, they're only the first 10 stay. Likewise, if I'm appending items, I can say limit negative 10, so let's just keep everything from the bottom uh, of a list up uh, to 10 items. And you get this primitive to limit a collection, and then, then you can build this idea of like uh, paginated infinite, uh, I think they call it like virtualized lists in the single page app world. Uh, you can do it incredibly uh, simply with some JavaScript that I had to write, but we'll see that. Uh, let me demo that real quick. Uh, so I'll go to this to-do app. So one of the goals with Live Beats was to show people what Live View could do and as a, learn as a, serve as a teaching tool. So this app that uh, GPT named for me as to-do to -do Trek is what I'm calling it. I'm going to open source it, and it's going to be an example of how to use streams and dynamic forms in Live View. Uh, so keep an eye out for that. Maybe a couple weeks, weeks from now, I'll open it up. Uh, but we'll, we'll see infinite scrolling in a moment, but we can really see what what streams can do for us here. So this is like a Trello clone, which is something historically I've also said, like, ah, you know, I don't really see all this drag and drop and stuff working well. I wasn't sure if LiveView would be good as a Trello clone. Turns out, yes, it can. It's like super easy. Um, so we have these lists of to-dos. Uh, all the items here are GPT generated. Anyway, I won't get into, like, I, I was like, GPT, like, instead of like in the seeds file, I was like, come up with like three categories for a to-do app for like regular life to-dos and make 100 items for each list and it just like spit this stuff out. And I was like, oh, that's really helpful. Uh, can you put that into an Elixir uh, array and, and group it by uh, the type? And then I just copy-pasted that into the seeds file. And anyway, pretty, pretty handy. Um, so this is a to-do application. So here I can like say I have a new to-do here, one, two, three. And it's, uh, it's going to be collaborative across uh, pages here. So I got this one that I've shrunk down. And the items are already there, but as I like, check things, like, of course it's collaborative. It's like the, it's like the Microsoft uh, keynote, like, of or I think, you know, when they were like, of course it's touch enabled, like, of course it just works on all browsers. Um, so yeah, deletes are just going to be propagated, and so all we have to do for a delete is, like, call stream delete on the right-hand side, we do a broadcast, the live view listens for operations, and it's like, oh, you have a delete, and then it just calls stream delete on itself, and, it, and so that's how items are, we propagate the, and replay the event. So just super easy, stream delete. Uh, everything is drag and droppable, so I, I'll show you the lemma. It's like 12 lines of JavaScript. So drag and drop just works. I thought I would, we would have to add live view primitives for it, but it turns out it's so little that it could just work. So as I drop this, it's going to be replayed on every browser. That's pretty cool. And I can move it to do to a list. So if you imagine this is going to be a stream delete. Well, let's go on the, the big one over here. This is going to be a stream delete out of the home list and then a stream add insert on the new list, right? And then it just works and we replay that. So it's like all these, like just these few operations allow you to build all kinds of things. And it turns out like when I built this, I was like, oh crap, like this is like, I really want to make the, I really want to make the list themselves a stream. And I was like, oh crap, like are, are streams nestable? And then it was like, let's find out. And it was like, oh, okay, like you could put a stream inside a stream. So there was actually one bug with that, but it's like <laughs> stream, nestable streams work. Um, which is pretty cool, like I never thought about, when I was building streams, I didn't even consider that. So yeah, so the, each of these lists here are drag and droppable, we replay that. And uh, yeah, so streams could do all kinds of neat things. And then I added this like activity feed beneath the stream, or sorry, beneath the to-dos, and this is like what's happening, right? So as I like mark things as done, we see what happened. So if I like rename this, re what is this? Research new workout routine. Okay, Jose and I talked about this earlier. Um, let's say like, do not ignore, I need to be better about working out. So yeah, you can see like it changed from like do not ignore and it happened on, you know, both sides replayed this and like there's a shockingly small amount of code to do all this. Like all that was was again, stream insert broadcast. Oh, you had a, a new item in the activity, stream insert. Um, but the coolest thing is like then to paginate over this, this stream at the bottom is gonna show like, you know, everything. So as I'm scrolling here, this is going to paginate and it's gonna be like this infinitely scrollable list. You can say like, hey, we're going through like hundreds or thousands of things. But the, I'm only keeping 50 of these in the DOM at a time as I'm paginating, right? So it's like this is like everything you would want out of like a single page app. Whereas like as a user scrolling, we don't want to be keeping everything in, in the DOM. We want to be just be like virtualizing the list. So it's just going to work for that. As I scroll up, I can page down. Page number is going to change. If the user overruns all the way to the top, we're back at do not ignore. We went back to page one. Uh, so that's pretty cool. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> So the amount of code to actually make that happen in your app is right here, which is pretty fun. So we have two new bindings, PHX viewport top, PHX viewport bottom, and that's just uh, when a container's first child hits the top of the viewport, 
sends an event to the server, just like PHX click. So here I'm just saying, as you're scrolling up, so it knows about scroll direction. So as you're scrolling up and you hit the top of the viewport, then send pre page to the server. That just does a query and does a stream insert with a limit. And then PHX viewport bottom is just gonna say send next page to the server as the last child of this container reaches the bottom of the viewport. And then this isn't required, but I'm also adding classes to this container. So like usually when you wanna do infinite scrolling and you're virtualizing the list, you want that scroll momentum to stay. You don't wanna have them constantly bottoming out and then having to like stop scrolling then scroll as things load. So I can just apply uh, this calc thing. I just, I learned this when I made this demo. Like you can, it's part of CSS. You can say uh, add padding bottom that's twice the height of the viewport and padding top that's twice the height of the, of the current viewport. So that just gives you like a large amount of, of uh, padding but isn't like a magic value. Like originally I had like, you know, a thousand PX or something. But then when I like shrunk the page down, it wasn't enough. So it turns out like CSS has solved this problem. So I'm just conditionally adding those classes. I'm conditionally adding the binding here. So this page is just like a design, you know, I don't want them to, as they hit the top of the viewport on the first item, I don't want to try to page to negative one. So this is just like standard uh, assign operations here. And then you don't have to write any JavaScript and you just get infinite scrolling and the page just updates and the stream limits itself. Uh, so, so that's it, so that's like what, 37 to 20, that's your virtualized infinite scrolling in live view soon. I mean, it works now. It's in, it's in the main branch if you want to play with it. Um, but yeah, so the streams are way more useful than I thought. Like, I thought I was just solving like this basic problem. I thought I was just making like the PHX update a pin not suck, but it turns out like they're amazingly useful for building all kinds of things. So essentially, anytime you have a collection in live view, you probably want to use a stream. Uh, you probably don't want to store it in memory, so streams uh, clean up after themselves, so nothing stays in memory. So. Definitely check them out if you haven't used them. They came out in LiveView 018, 16, but some of the cool features uh, haven't made it yet, so try the main branch if you're interested. Uh, another big thing was dynamic forms. I know it's like, it's weird for me to say, like I started LiveView to solve the dynamic real-time form problem, and like it's like one of the last things we're completely solving. Um, but like, to be clear, like LiveView has always been great for, uh, for interactive forms. We've just like really sucked for nested forms. So I can credit Jose initially for, we have this new two form uh, primitive, which is like we, we wrote a new data structure to serve as a basis for forms, and that allowed us to do a lot more efficient change tracking on the form. And then on top of that, we were able to finally solve this uh, pesky problem here. So LiveView has been great for forms until you had it like a, until you had an input score. Like any anytime you had like with an ecto schema, a cast ASOC or a cast embed, it was very kludgy. Um, but only in certain scenarios. So like if you, input score worked beautifully if you had a fixed number of children. So if you just wanted to invite one user to this list, you were golden, or just two. But if you wanted to, like most people say, like, well, it's live view, it should be interactive. If you just want to add, had an add more and, and an X to delete, like this became very hard and um, uh, unnecessarily difficult. Uh, so we finally, like, to get to 1.0, we knew we had to solve this problem. So finally, after streams, I was like, let's, let's solve this. Uh, so I went and tried to make like this example right here and realized what sucks about it. Like, I won't go into all the details, but basically like it's very difficult to have the, uh, have Ecto and your casting code on the server know where the children should or should not exist and the order of those children. And I was like, I don't know how I'm gonna solve this. I, I had some ideas for Jose. I was like, okay, it's gonna have to be like, I'm gonna have to write some JavaScript as I always do. And it's gonna have to be live view specific where we could have like an add, more primitive for forms and we can make it work. Um, and Jose was like, no, check boxes, man. Like, listen. Um, so, <laughs> so literally like, I was like, I don't know how we're gonna solve this uh, without a bunch of like custom bespoke solutions. And uh, I, anyway, so I was like, what is this? Like year 2000, like check boxes? Um, so but that turns out to be like the perfect answer. Um, and I'll, I'll show you why, but uh, check boxes, like we can kind of abuse how they work on the client. Uh, but the, the neat thing about checkboxes is like I was thinking this would only work with, with live view, but if we use checkboxes, we could actually make this same abstraction work for uh, live view and dead view. So anywhere you have Phoenix HTML form, doing inputs and inputs for, like this would just work on either side of the equation, which is super, super nice. It also gives you like bulk operations. So if you wanted to do like a bulk delete, you know, like check, 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 delete these things, like it just works because they're checkboxes. So I have to demo that to, to make you appreciate it because Initially, uh, I, I was skeptical. Uh, so let me go into a form component. Yeah, here it is. So let me go to this page here. Let's see if we're seeing this uh, a little bit. Let me blow it up. Okay, so we have this form. Oops, we have this form. 
And I want to invite these users with like a plus and a delete. Like, it shouldn't be that difficult, right? And this is like, this is when I went down the rabbit hole that everyone else has to go down where you realize like the parameters on the server have to be filtered to delete things, or you have to delete something on the client in JavaScript and trigger some JavaScript to make Phoenix think that you changed the form. Like, I went down the same rabbit hole that all of us collectively as a community did and all these hacks to make this actually work. And it turns out like, oh, you can just write checkboxes, but it, it requires some other features. So first, uh, the server to ultimately figure out how to delete things and put things in the proper order, I had to write a bunch of bespoke code in my change that function. And then Jose and I were like, well, how do we abstract this so everyone can use it? So to be clear, like this is, this, there are new features in Ecto that allow you to use these new uh, checkbox features, so you might be thinking like, well, I'm not using Ecto, but the same 20 lines of code to filter through uh, some parameters could be applied anywhere. This is just, it works in, I was gonna add it to live view uh, form handling, but since it works on any form now, then we, we can put it in Ecto, it's gonna work everywhere. Uh, so the way this works is I need to tell Ecto, here I have like these notifications. Uh, first thing I need to do is I need to tell Ecto my embeds mini is actually uh, on replace delete because we need to tell Ecto like when the client is trying to send params up for all the notifications, like we wanna replace them all. We aren't trying to like do a partial replace. And then on my cast embed, this is familiar to anyone who's done nested associations, you have like cast it with some other function. And here there are two new options which shipped with the latest version of Ecto, it's out right now. You have a sort param, so you can say look for whatever I wanna call it, I'm gonna call it notifications order and you can say I have a, a drop param. I'm gonna look for notifications delete. And this is a way for Ecto to look for uh, some associated data that comes alongside the notifications param, and then it's aware of like, oh, the client's telling me these are the order things should be in, and these are the things I should, these are the children I should actually delete. So now that I've done those two line changes over here, I can go back to my form, and here is where I can add like a plus or a delete, so we can start with like, let's say the add more option here. So we do some regular HTML and we can say like, it's gonna say add more and here's where I can just write a regular, regular checkbox. So you'll see the magic of checkboxes here. So this is gonna be type equals checkbox. Uh, we'll make it pretty later, but we can just say the name of this thing is what Ecto is gonna be looking for. So it's gonna be a list, uh, what do we call it? Notifications order. And that thing itself is gonna be a list that the client sends up. And the way Ecto works is, if it gets a, uh, an item that it hasn't seen before, it, it creates a new association for it. So we don't even need to give a value here. And I also need to tell Ecto for each individual child, we need to say what its order is. So here, instead of a checkbox for, oops, inside the inputs for, I can render a hidden input. And this is a way Ecto can actually track where these children are located. So I can say the uh, value of this hidden input is going to be uh, this nested forms index. Because the tricky thing, if anyone's gone down this dynamic form path before this feature, is like as you prepend an item, it shifts all of the form inputs down, and that means the form input name changes, and the form input name, form input name is uh, what we're using to tie like uh, errors on the client together, and also what Ecto is using for like the ordering. So like you have to have necessarily stitch these things together. So this should be enough for us to get uh, pins working. Maybe. Okay, so I have this add more. It's not very pretty. We can say this is the first thing. Oh my goodness, it works. So there's the second thing. So cool, but you're like, okay, checkboxes. Like my clients, you know, my requirements are gonna be like, okay, make this not a checkbox, please. Uh, so, so don't fear, like, uh, and I think, that I forget Jose and I's conversation, but Jose, I think was just like, put it in a label, and then when you click anything in the label, it checks the checkbox. Like, this is like a solved problem. It turns out like, some decisions on the web like have made sense. Like this is a solved problem. Like if you put a checkbox inside a label, clicking on uh, any element inside that thing is gonna check the checkbox. So what we can do here is we can say like, well, we don't even need to see uh, that checkbox, right? So we can say class hidden, and then we could even say like, this is gonna be uh, cursor, what is it, pointer? Yeah, cursor pointer. And we can even add like an icon here, right? Like icon name equals uh, hero plus something or other, right? plus circle, sure, sounds good. All right, we save this and like, oh, look at this beautiful, and it's like, it's a, it's a checkbox underneath, right? <laughs> so like, so it's pretty cool, and like, this is just gonna work for dead views as well, right? So you're like, you get all the UI uh, features that you want, and then prepends just become like, the neat thing about this approach, I'll, I'll show the, the data that was sent to the server. 
But the neat thing about the way uh, the checkbox works is like the order of the params here is going to be just the order that they appear in the UI, which is the exact order that we want. So prepends are just like copy and paste this thing up here. And oh yeah, we have HTML formatting within mixed format, it's amazing. Uh, thanks Felipe. Uh, so we can say like prepend, I can give this a plus, sure, and then I, I, it's just the exact same thing because it's gonna appear first before the, the, the prepend is gonna appear before all the input for and also before the, the appends. So that should be enough for, uh, for pins here. So this is gonna be the first one. This is gonna be the second one. And if, if, if brave souls have made it this far on their own before this, like they, they've gotten this far, like I did, and you're like, it works, like we've solved it. And then like they see like a live view uh, error here show up, and then like they get crushed because then when they do a prepend, like the error wouldn't, wouldn't stick with that input because again, like the name of the input changed, but really we needed to tie that error to input at index uh, two instead of index one. So like this is where people would make it this far on the, on the trek and then fall off the cliff. Um, but we've solved that uh, as well. So we can now prepend here, this is zero, and it's just gonna work. The validations are gonna stay where they belong and we're doing some bookkeeping for, for everyone internally. So I wanna add deletes and then we can look at the, uh, we can look at the params that are being set down. So deletes are just gonna be very similar. It's a checkbox. Um, we'll add it here, some formatting. And uh, this can be, this is gonna be notifications delete, I think it's what we called it. And the value is going to be the index that we wanna delete. That's nested.index. And I don't even need to say anything, right? We just want to render like a X or something. Hero X mark, I think. Refresh here, sure. Okay, so we have this X showing up. Let's add like this is the first one. Two, we'll pin one for good measure and then we delete this one. And it just deletes, oh my goodness. Uh, but no, like this is like, if people have gone on this journey on their own, like this is like days of work because I, I went down the same path. So like, <laughs> <laughs> There's some really annoying things that you have to solve here, but the coolest thing is, oh, you can see apparently I, I'm logging something. I'm an IO puts driven developer. I know DBG exists, but I'm still old have it's die hard. Uh, but we can see what we sent along with these form changes, like a checkbox when you check it is just a regular PHX change event, right? So what comes up in this list notifications that gets parsed uh, by plug, we have like this uh, keyed payload by the uh, index of where it existed in the DOM, and then alongside that param are these defined notification order param or notification uh, delete param. And you can see like we're just telling Ecto like, hey, I'm actually gonna delete the thing at, in, oops, at index zero. Apparently we sent a diff to the client for some reason. Um, I was probably debugging some Heeks bug. All right, I'll just redo it. And then notification order is similar where we're just sending like, hey, Ecto, put these children back in order. And that's the way appends work because if I send like an add more, it's just a checkbox. So checkboxes aren't sent unless they're checked. So we're, this is the way we were able to like abuse that feature. It's like usually a feature like the checkbox function component and the Phoenix HTML checkbox input, uh, those exist to render a hidden input to solve the problem of checkboxes not sending to the server unless they're checked because usually programmers wanna know. But in this case, we can actually use the case where, no, you just render a checkbox. If it's not checked, no value is sent. So in this case, when I check it, I just get the value on here, but Ecto could receive anything here. So what Ecto says is like, if I, don't, if I get a key in the order for something that doesn't exist, right, so here's zero, but if it sees whatever value is here, in this case, checked sends on by default, at least in Safari, Ecto says I'm gonna create a new child. So with a few checkbox primitives and a couple features in Ecto, uh, we get this, Beautiful, oh, also some hacks I'm not gonna go into, but like, see this persistent ID thing? That solves the uh, bookkeeping of stitching together uh, as inputs shift around on the client that you haven't saved. It, it keeps the, uh, that error and everything tied together. So live you had to, had to do a little massaging here as well. But this solves like all these foot guns that people had. Uh, so this was like, I think one of the biggest pe problems that people have had with uh, Phoenix Live View and especially Ecto chain sets, uh, making them work for dynamic forms. It's now solved with checkboxes, like who would have thought? Um, but it's really neat because, like I said, it's, it's entirely flexible. Like whatever you want the UI to look like, I was thinking it would be some live view like uh, a form a pin child thing, but then I was like, what if someone wanted to wrap that in like, like a, their own HTML tag? So we would have to accept like the type of tag you wanted. What if you wanted classes on it? With a checkbox, you can do whatever you want. 
It works for dev use as well. Bulk actions are just supported because you just check, 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 click save, and it's just gonna work. So that's where we're headed to Phoenix Live U10. These are some things which, uh, some things for the future, some things which I may or may not land. Uh, um, like development debugger is something that's been on our list for a long time. Uh, Jason on the Phoenix team uh, has been uh, really vocal about this because as anyone using Live View, like something blows up on the server and you're like, you get the loading bar or like on Phoenix 1.7 you get like a flash message, but you're like, ah, oh, what happened? So you check the logs, but Live View is like, we're fault, we're tol we're fault tolerant, right? So it immediately tries to remount, but then when it remounts, like what if it crashes then? So anyway, you try to find the error that happened and then you have to scroll up like a thousand entries in your logs to figure out what happened. So the development experience would be nice if like we had a plug debugger for Live View where like something crashes and you just see in the UI like the stack trace. So there's a lot we could do there. Uh, Michael Crum on the Phoenix team has explored some of these ideas with like a Phoenix development toolbar. Uh, so there's a lot of things we could do, but at minimum I think we could replicate the plug debugger um, at least as a step one. Uh, co-located JavaScript hooks is something I wanted to be in for 1.0. It may or may not happen, uh, but basically the, the amount of JavaScript that we usually have to ship alongside Live View is like tiny, like this drag and drop uh, that I'll show everyone like it's like 12 lines of code, right? So here's the sortable hook. It fits on this like blown up screen here. And we're just saying when something's dropped, I just do a push event to the server and uh, it's just gonna say like, did you do a data drop or if not, we'll just send a reposition event. But all we're getting on the server is like the old index and the new index of the thing that was dropped. So like it, so all, everyone that ships reusable libraries right now, there's no way to co-locate just these sprinkles of JS that do the things that you want to do. So I'm using sortable. So the only thing required here is like import sortable from the vendor folder and then write 12 lines of code and you get drag and drop. Um, so this is like all the JavaScript for the to-do app. I think there's like, oh, oh, I didn't even show that. Um, does, is it just gonna work? It may not work. Uh, so yeah, I have that that handles. Anyway, these are drag and droppable as well. So like if you wanted drag and drop nested associations, uh, all you would have to do is add like that JavaScript expects like a handle to be there. Uh, and drag and drop would just work. So when you drop it, we send up the, when you drop it, the order, the checkbox order changes in the DOM and then the order just gets sent to the server and everything just works. That's actually pretty incredible. Um, so anyway, the, the idea is it would be nice if someone shipped a Tailwind component library, a bootstrap library, just a reusable uh, component library, even within their own organization that they could package up the JavaScript required uh, for those things. Uh, and right now you have to basically tell the user like, hey, bundle this JS into your app, um, figure it out. It'd be nice if you could just like, you know, I'm not advocating co-locating a ton of JavaScript alongside your Heeks template, alongside Elixir, but if it's 12 lines of code, like there's no reason this just can't exist in my Elixir file. Like I, w I would be totally fine with this. Uh, so I, will, I do want to solve that, but it may or may not make it for 1.0. Uh, there's this unified uh, live view, live component messaging abstraction that is missing, like it, you, people work around it, but the issue is if I render a live component, the live component has to know, if it, and it wants to tell its parent about something that happened. How do you message your parent? Well, it's like, well, if, you, if my parent is a live view, I need to do a message send. If my parent was a live component, I need to do a send update. So like there are ways to solve this where like the parent says, here's how you send things back to me, but it seems like there's a commonality there uh, for something for, for us to implement. But uh, if you ha have had those kind of issues, definitely reach out to me. I think there's a very simple interface we've come up with. And then I keep coming back to this transport live session stash idea. Um, I don't know if it's a good idea, but basically like live view is amazing because you don't have to keep refetching state um, because we're stateful. So if you think about like live navigation is amazing because it's a WebSocket frame navigation, but then I still have to fetch the current user uh, if I'm remounting a live view. So it's like, well, if they were already on the app and I'm over the WebSocket frame, why couldn't I just keep them there? So I think there's some idea of like transferring state. Well, tra I, I use that word cautiously. I think it's a very good thing that these things are isolated and fetch the data because they can recover properly. So we have to be careful how, how I talk about this and how we would implement it. But it would be nice to stash state somewhere once and be able to reuse it instead of refetching it later. Um, that's it. If you have any questions, if there's time, I'll take them. Otherwise, uh, find me after. Thanks. Thank you, Chris. Uh, any questions? Got one over here. In the middle. Ah, thank you. Hey there. First, thank you so much for live view. That's just amazing and makes my life so much easier. Um, 
uh, I have a question regarding the delta tracking that you were mentioning. That was basically since Lex, I think you said, there it was introduced and then went all the way. And we had earlier yesterday, I think, a talk about like how to optimize your variable binding so you get less deltas. Was there any anywhere like an approach to try to do it different, like do the delta tracking maybe on the final HTML or something to really reduce it to the minimum? Maybe you could, can talk about that a bit. Yeah, so when we started, we weren't HTML aware. So it was like this, this static and dynamic splitting was like super easy. So like one nice thing about it was like it didn't have to be HTML aware. Uh, so we didn't have to write an HTML engine for it. Um, but it, it is interesting, like had we had an HTML engine from the start, like would we have done things differently? Um, and it seems like intuitively you're like, oh yeah, we could diff the HTML, but I think, I'd have to think more about it, but it, anytime I thought about this in the past, like in order to diff the HTML, we would have had to keep, we, it seems like we would have to keep a lot more state on the server because we would almost have to keep that entire uh, AST of the template around, potentially. Well, I guess we could just reparse it every time. But no, it's a good question. I, I've often had this thought, but you know, starting with the diffing engine first before the HTMLware engine kind of necessitated where we landed, but I think it would actually be way more complicated to try to then, dip, like basically like what Morph Dom is doing on the server is what you're asking, right? Yeah, and exactly, just, yeah. exactly. So I feel like we would, it'd be, it would be way more resources because we'd have to like parse the markup and then diff a VDOM on the server. And it's kind of like what Morph Dom ended up saying. They were like, well, what if we just didn't need virtual DOM? And what if we just like did the thing? So I feel like we've taken the Morph Dom approach on the server, but I can't, I'd have to load in my brain like, you know, how we could do it efficiently. So there may be some wins by taking like the VDOM approach now that we're HTML aware that, that I can't picture, but yeah, it's a good question. I've had the same thoughts. Yeah, thank you so much. It's like the Olympic relay over here. Um, yeah, hello, thank you for your talk. Um, I wondered, so like, Live View is kind of bringing this dream of like full stack, single language, SPA-like development um, from the back end forwards. Then you have things in the JavaScript space like Next, like Remix, like SvelteKit that are kind of going the other direction. They're going from the JavaScript space and bringing it back to the server. Um, what would you say to somebody who was starting today um, who had no experience in JavaScript, no experience in Elixir to kind of sell the, uh, the Phoenix and Live View side of things compared to the other ecosystems? Yeah, I mean, it's a great, it's a great question. Obviously, I'm going to be biased here. So it's actually really interesting because like I took React and I put it on the server and then I'm not saying like React, this is why they did server components, but it's like, I was like, oh, React, we should put that on the server. And then React was like, oh wait, they put React on the server. We should put React on the server. Uh, so it's like we've come full circle. Um, but the thing with at least React server components, and I, I haven't looked at uh, what SvelteKit's doing. So um, everything I've seen is uh, no one from the front end space that I'm aware, maybe next, so you have to correct me, has, is adopting like this bi-directional flow approach where it's like React is still basically request response. It, they're still in the, state, the stateless realm where like the server can render things and hydrate the DOM, but it's very much like client focus and then you just go refetch things. So I, I still think like if you want to just like, for us where I, you just get a broadcast and then I'm like, oh, I want to update the other browser. I just do like stream insert on the other side. And I haven't thought about like how does a client get that? Whereas, and like I said, I have not used React Server Components or SvelteKit. My understanding is it's not just going to be you pick it up in a server component and suddenly the UI updates because it's not, uh, I think it's more uni unidirectional, but I could be wrong. Um, but I think in general, I mean, it's hard to answer this in an unbiased way because for me it's like the, starting from the client to the server, like when I'm, when I'm thinking about architecting an application, I'm not like going necessarily from the UI to the back end. It's like you think about like what is my system, oops, what is my system doing? And then I, I build a UI to like work within that. So I feel like starting at the front end and then mixing in the back end for me is just gonna produce something more complex and like less desirable, but then it's probably like choose your own, pick your own poison. So there are trade-offs obviously, like you know, things that the client can do immediately, we have to make a round trip for. So I think what I would say to someone is like, I think I can, I can say this unbiasedly, it's gonna be way simpler to use Elixir, uh, Phoenix and LiveView than it would be any client-side ecosystem. I mean, just because I've been in the JavaScript ecosystem, like you're gonna have, again, that labyrinth of complexity exists. So like even if you're using server components, you have to figure out how to wire that up, how to get the, the build tools to work, what's gonna work uh, tomorrow as you get started, it's gonna fail a month from now. And like, it's just like, that's just the reality. So uh, anyway, that's my best answer, but it's a good question. I think like we're, we're both converging, the client side community is like a pendulum has swung to the server side. So they're converging back to the server. Whereas we kind of push with JS commands to do more things on the client. 
So it's like we're both trying to solve the same problems uh, at the diff from, coming from different directions. So it's just interesting to see how those dynamics work. Any other questions? All right, let's give Chris another hand. <laughs> <laughs>